This is The Wheelhouse. I'm John Dankosky. Join our conversation at WNPR.org slash The Wheelhouse. You can also find us on Facebook and Twitter at WNPR Wheelhouse. We're joined, as always, by Colin McEnroe. He's the host of The Colin McEnroe Show on WNPR. Howdy, Colin. Good morning, Mr. Dankosky. Also with us is Emily Munson. She's state capital reporter for Hearst, Connecticut Media, the many newspapers of Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hello there, Emily. Good morning. And Bill Curry is here. He's our political analyst, a former Democratic nominee for governor and advisor in the Clinton White House. Always good to see you, Bill. Great to be with you, sir. So there's so much to talk about in just a little bit. We're going to be talking with Emily about all the things that are happening at the state capitol right now with budget proceedings, et cetera. But let's start on the bigger national scale. There's new Quinnipiac CNN morning consult polls that have Joe Biden off to, well, let's say a very good start since formally announcing his entry into the 2020 presidential race last Thursday. Double-digit leads over any of his Democratic rivals. In New Hampshire, there's a Suffolk University survey that finds him leading the field with 20 percent support ahead of Bernie Sanders and Pete Buttigieg's 12 percent, and then Elizabeth Warren at 8 percent, everyone else trailing far behind. We talked a little bit about Joe Biden a couple weeks ago when he um, sort of entered the race, Colin, but now he's firmly in the race. He's put out another video. He's talked in front of my hometown Pittsburghers to uh, make his case for why he should be the next president. Um, are we surprised that Joe Biden is off to a huge lead so far? I'm a little surprised by that. I mean, there's sort of been a kind of second boom, a couple of polls that have taken him from the 20s to the high 30s. Q poll, which dropped last night, has him at 38. Um, that's higher. I mean, he he was unmistakably and you know, uncontestably the front runner even you know before that. I mean, but it was like a 28-21 kind of spread between him and Bernie Sanders. Now he's opened up a bigger lead. I mean, it's borderline meaningless. Um, not a vote has been cast in a primary. Not a debate has been had. Uh, the candidates aren't even at the point where they're trying to see how much damage they can inflict on one another, which d- does tend to sort things out or at least change the ratios and numbers a little bit. So I don't know what it means. And, and in some ways, there's an almost superstitious way that people think about this sometimes, which is it's really difficult to maintain uh, a front runner position from wire to wire. You know, one reason that uh, people always complain that we cover politics like a horse race. Well, one reason we do that is it is kind of a horse race. <laughs> First of all, you're, you, what, as you watch the donations come in, people are betting money on dumb animals. So right away, <laughs> there's a similar similarity. Uh, but also, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to stay in the lead all the way through the Kentucky Derby. Uh, usually, you know, you put on your surge uh, at a certain point, and that's how you win. So I don't know how much, I mean, he's got high name recognition. He's been a vice president. I mean, he's reaping the benefit of all that and and his position as the most favored establishment candidate. But a lot of people are going to stay on the sidelines till they see how well he actually runs, because there are other establishment candidates they could turn to if he turns out to have peaked early. Well, what's interesting about this, Emily, is so leading up to this point, uh, when Joe Biden got into the race, What we've been hearing about across the country is kind of a new kind of Democratic Party, including faces that aren't running for president right now, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who seem to be um, promoting a different sort of progressive Democrat. They're younger. uh, They're people of color. They're people who look an awful lot different than Joe Biden. Joe Biden gets into the race in this new world of Democrats and immediately soars to the top. Is this surprising to you? Well, Joe Biden has the name recognition factor. He's run for president a couple times previously. Um, But also, you know, while so many Democrats are running toward toward the left and towards um, younger Democratic constituents, there's a good portion of the party who are 50 plus more centrist individuals and who have said, you know, the, the presidency of Donald Trump has been crazy. We want a return to more stability, moderacy and normalcy, and perhaps Joe Biden is the candidate to deliver that. But perhaps he's the candidate to deliver it, um, Bill. I, I don't know. It, he's he's not necessarily delivering anything particularly new, and it seems as though an awful lot of Democrats, including, I would guess, an awful lot of young Democrats, are probably looking for something a little bit new, even from a candidate who's old like Joe, and he doesn't seem to be wanting to give them anything particularly new. You know, there's, there's a couple of ways of looking at this. One, he got, a, he got a big bump. I'm not sure the bump came from his announcements as much as it came from all of Trump's tweets. Uh, Trump is doing everything he can to elevate Biden, uh, you know, uh, against his against his interest because he just can't help himself. Uh, And I think that made an enormous difference this week. I think that, uh, you know, when you look back at the 2018 crop of candidates who took the House, as Nancy Pelosi continuously points out, 
they look and sound a lot more like Biden than they do like Ocasio-Cortez, who has a tremendous following and gets tremendous cable uh, uh, attention, uh, uh, often for some very creative – often she earns it, by the way. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but, but the party's always been a, a, a more complex and somewhat more Biden-like uh, 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 phenomenon. The question here, though, uh, when, if you think about it, uh, and, and by the way, you, you can also just take a look. But Biden's about 10 points, 12 points behind where Hillary was at this point in the race, both relative to Bernie and relative to the rest of the field and, and, uh, and overall standing. And so it's, you know, you know, we've seen how these things can go before uh, if, if you're looking for a comparison. The real question of the Democratic Party is, is to work these differences out. And there's this little family talk that the Democrats have been putting off for decades. Their differences aren't that great. Their differences over the public option, the differences over trade, the differences over education. Uh, uh, there are a set of uh, uh, there are a set of things that they have to th- that they have to use this presidential primary to uh, to sort out. And the the problem for Biden, I think, uh, if you look at the party as a whole, however they looked and sounded. Everybody was more of an economic populist. Nobody's pushing Hillary's 2016 message. Everybody's pushing, to, in some form, Bernie's 2016 message. And I mean everybody. And the question is, where is that center? And I think the Democrats have to distinguish between two centers, and Biden especially. Biden's been part of a Washington center in which very powerful moneyed interests collaborate on, on deregulating Wall Street and gutting the bankruptcy laws uh, and uh, deregulating communications, et cetera. And at the Democratic base, there's much more idealism, much more popular sentiment, but there's not enough effort to look, reach out to what I think is America's center, which is fiscally prudent. It's as economically populist as Bernie. Mm-hmm. That's the secret to understanding both camps. But it's also very practical and very fiscally prudent. And so can we answer the hard questions about the bigger ideas we have? That's the, that's the challenge for all the Democrats, whether it's Biden, Bernie, Warden. Can you answer the, the, the legitimate questions of average voters who are concerned about how much this stuff costs and whether it really works? Mm. Colin? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe I would uh, – although I, I think Bill and I don't disagree about this. But I mean I, I guess I would contrast what he's saying right now with the fact that you could argue that there is a significant rift, a, a real partitioning of the Democratic Party. And it's – I mean one thing we know from the Democratic uh, field in, in the gubernatorial race uh, in the last cycle here in Connecticut is everybody runs as a progressive. And in the case of Connecticut, nobody meant it. I mean there, there were actually no progressive candidates uh, in that field, although all of them self-identified that way. If we're going to say that progressivism really means some kind of significant redistribution of resources, money, power, access uh, to education, all that kind of stuff, if that's what progressivism is, there, there aren't as many – of those in the Democratic Party as claimed to be. And so, yeah, a lot of people are going to run as, pro- as progressives um, and a lot of them aren't going to really mean it that much. Uh, and, and so, yeah, a lot of people are adopting Bernie's rhetoric. If Biden starts to adopt r- Bernie's rhetoric, my first instinct is going to be to doubt his word. I don't <laughs> think he really means it. But yeah, this is one of the ways that you get nominated. You, uh, Emily, you spent an awful lot of time with with the Democrats who run the state of Connecticut at the at the Capitol, and we're going to be talking about some of the things that, that they're doing with a new Democratic governor in just a little bit. But can you read anything about the the center, as Bill was talking about, of the Democratic Party from the Democrats that you talk to here in the state? You know, who's actually thinking we need to make a change, and who's actually thinking no matter what we do, we just got to position ourselves to beat Donald Trump? Yeah, I, I thought. Colin made a really good point there, which is, you know, Governor Ned Lamont ran as a progressive candidate. But as we've seen from his uh, his desire not to raise taxes on the wealthy, um, you know, he he is trending more moderate, at least in his tax policy. Um, and that is something that the progressives, at least in the House Democratic Caucus, um, are infuriated over. And, th- and this is um, a growing sector of Democrats. Uh, there are about 43 House Democratic members of the Progressive Caucus, and they're a very new group. They only formed last year, and they're pretty, you know, they're trying to unify. They're, they're trying to get their act together. And if they could actually vote as a block, they could be influential in shaping in pushing uh, the Democratic Party in a more progressive direction here in Connecticut. Uh, but we've kind of yet to see them uh, use their influence. I, a last thing before we turn off the subject, Bill, <clears throat> you were you know, talking a little bit about w- what tends to happen over time as 
you know, you get into debates. I know Colin mentioned this and, and you start to draw differences between these candidates. We've already seen a little bit of this on Twitter and on social media. There's a cam- cannibalization amongst these Democrats who haven't had this talk about <laughs> what the party's supposed to be about. And, you know, the Bernie guys are hardening their positions. If you're for Elizabeth Warren, you can't stand Bernie Sanders. If you're for Joe Biden, you don't want one of these progressives. I, I guess I just wonder if after a year of this, if the Democrats are going to have anything left after this feeding frenzy, this sort of circular firing squad. Well, first of all, I mean, I just uh, uh, politics since I got into it uh, in the late 19th century. Uh, you spend all, all day meeting people who are positive they're right about something. And, uh, you know, one of the great, you know. And seldom are. Yes. And one of the great virtues in this life is the ability to be provisional in all of your thinking, yeah. just in case the facts turn out to be otherwise. And our politics, there's, we're a kind of mirror of each other, both parties. The, the, I find the Republican politics virulent, but both parties engage in a lot of catharsis, symbology, uh, gestures. You have to be for shutting down the government over immigration. You have to be for abolishing ICE. You have to be the, – these, these, these tropes and memes appear and people have to grasp onto them and then positions harden. But I will tell you that I think a greater uh, 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 danger here is the one that I, I mentioned and that is that we've been putting this, uh, uh, th- this uh, talk off for so long. We differ over trade. Uh, all the elites in the Democratic Party were for every trade agreement of my lifetime. Most of the base opposed everyone. Uh, it's the Bernie Hillary Fulcrum if you want. And then when the election's over, we don't talk about it anymore. And it's one of the reasons we have Trump in that he flourishes in a policy vacuum. If you can't – except for the, uh, one of the, the Castro brother that's running for president. Uh, no Democrat has voluntarily given an, a, a, a speech on immigration in a year that I know of, has voluntarily given a speech on trade. We tiptoe around our own tender spots. And the people at the top of the party say, don't cannibalize yourself. Don't start shouting. Don't have these arguments. They also say, don't run in the general election as independent, which I'm all for. If you want to get to that blueprint, you have to have some of this fighting. It's not all unhealthy. We can do this. Well, and actually, let's just turn to something that's happening in Washington right now. Nancy Pelosi has been discouraging House Democrats uh, who want to go down the impeachment route. She says she needs to score policy victories ahead of the 2020 election, even as this election is already really underway. After meeting with President Trump Tuesday, Pelosi announced a $2 trillion plan is in the works on infrastructure, although details, of course, are very, very sketchy. Um, I don't know. Is this the right? Is this the right route for Pelosi and other Democratic leaders to take as Joe Biden now takes over the mantle of being the anti-Trump at the top of the Democratic Party? I, I think Pelosi's right. I mean, first of all, there just isn't popular support for impeachment, and impeachment could be a fairly disruptive, conversation-dominating issue in, at a moment where some of the issues that Bill just named probably should rise to the top and should be in a very important and spotlighted way be debated and so forth. I mean, there's one important issue out of all of this, all of all of the, the Mueller report stuff, which is Russia tried to interfere in our elections. They were successful to some degree. There's no reason to suppose they're not going to continue to try to interfere in our elections. Are we hardening off in a way that could pre- prevent that? That's a great conversation to have and everybody from both parties should be really interested in having it. But I think an impeachment conversation, no, it's a, it's, it really ultimately is going to be a distraction. There aren't the numbers to achieve it without more evidence. And, and there's stuff they really do need to talk about that are that's much more important at a very ground level to a lot of Americans. And a, a part of that, Emily, is, you know, this state wanting to get transportation money here, wanting to actually take advantage of whatever. And Donald Trump's been saying it's infrastructure week for the last couple of years. And it never really has been. But maybe if Connecticut can help to capture some of this money, some of the stuff we got to rebuild can actually get rebuilt. This is something that um, Congressman John Larson and Congressman Jim Himes have uh, been supporting and been focused on for a while. Um, Governor Ned Lamont last month, I believe, um, met with Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao um, down in Washington. And this has been, you know, a part of Lamont's plan to bring more transportation revenue to the state. Uh, He supports tolls, of course, as a way to do that. But he also wants to maximize the federal dollars that Connecticut can get. And that's a really important part of his transportation vision going forward, especially for projects like the the I-84 viaduct here in Hartford. Um, So 
if a deal can be reached um, in Washington, I think that's something that a lot of Connecticut Democrats would support. Yeah, especially John Larson wants to build a gigantic tunnel that goes like 17 miles underneath the... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> underneath the the Connecticut River. Um, I, I want to quickly turn then, Bill, to the other political thing that, that Colin mentioned. We, more news on the Mueller report just in the last day. Both the Post and the Times are reporting that uh, Special Counsel Robert Mueller was, let's just say, unhappy enough with Attorney General William Barr's uh, summarization of his findings in the Russia probe that he complained to his boss, both in writing and in a subsequent phone call. Um, you know, we've got Barr talking about this in Congress even as we speak today. I mean, which more should we make of this? I guess we probably assumed Robert Mueller wasn't that happy with how Barr uh, read his report. Uh, one of the great shortcomings of Mueller's performance has been that he leaves us speculating as to how he's felt about so many things and for so long at a time of great crisis. It is a great disappointment to me. Uh, I would just say this will this will make you think my life's a lot emptier than it really is. Uh, but I read the Mueller report. And... Uh, uh, and I just want to say emphatically, to, I know that almost, hardly anyone has because it's 400 pages and it's dense. Um, the part where he describes the behaviors of collusion and obstruction are overwhelming. To read this report is to be more upset than you could possibly be if you haven't read it. Uh, there is no question in my mind that, he is, that, 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 that Mueller believes that there was collusion. The people who work in national media don't read this stuff uh, apparently. Uh, even Wolf Blitzer, let alone Sean Hannity, keeps saying, well, the report found no collusion. It specifically said he had no findings about collusion because it wasn't a, a crime under the statute he was empowered to look at. And he didn't fi- – said he said he was looking for conspiracy under three very specific statutes. And he didn't say that he didn't find it. He said that he didn't find enough facts, af- a- 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 unsurprising given that he didn't interview enough people, to prove it. But if you read it, the, the overwhelming message of, of the Mueller report is that there was collusion. It was systemic. It was, it was uh, repeated. There was obstruction. And the first question, when they finally get Mueller himself in front of a congressional committee, which they should do like this afternoon, is it is clear from this report that you believe that by a preponderance of the evidence, if not by the specific standards of these legal theories that you worry about within the department policy and as uh, uh, reflecting these two statutes, these, these three statutes, in, you really believe that by a preponderance of the evidence, the standard it would take to win a civil case, mm-hmm. that there was collusion and there was obstruction, and you wanted to come to Congress and say, you have to look at this because this is your job, not mine. Now deal with it. And if that happens, impeachment is very much back on the table. It'll never be a political winner for Democrats. Uh, it'll be a tough, tough hold. The question is whether you owe the democracy uh, this great risk of making sure that you defend it in this hour versus the practical pro- uh, 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 question of uh, you know, getting some political gain out of it. Is, is part of the problem that either Bob Mueller didn't do all of this fast enough or that if it's going to take as long as it's taken, that it was not a complete document that allowed him to answer the questions, to do all the interviews, to actually make a point, the point that at the end the American people would read and say, aha, this is actually what we need to do. The, one of the things, you know, as you know, I've been studying public corruption for a long time, and one of the great lessons of public corruption is that what costs us the most money uh, and the most self-respect isn't the things that are illegal, bribing a councilman for a parking concession, but all the things that are wrong but still legal, pay-to-play politics, revolving doors. And that's, that's why we're the only country in the world that's declared war on its own solar industry and is rolling back its fuel efficiency standards and betting big on coal. It's the power of money. And what we, the lesson we always have is about needing to fix statutes. The idea that you could have a serious attempt by a foreign power to rig an American election and on its face, the collaboration of who, the man who is now the sitting president with that foreign power to accomplish that end and have a report that is not presented to the public but only to a hireling of the man charged, which is then redacted. It reminds us that 95 percent of what's classified in this country, and maybe 99, I had top security clearance for two years. I can tell you from experience, most of our secrets are secrets to protect the reputations of the people keeping them, not to protect the national security of the country. If you have The fact that you have a special counsel sta- uh, statute that was tweaked when no one was looking so that we had no guarantee as the American people of ever finding out the answer is a travesty. We all ought to stand up and demand better.
Colin? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I, should Donald Trump be impeached? I, I would say absolutely. I mean, in, in a perfect world, uh, even heuristically looking at the behavior that is public, you can certainly see that he and his campaign had just regular contact with Russians who were trying to disrupt the American democracy. Uh, and they didn't report those contacts as they were supposed to. Even when they were briefed on this, they, they A, didn't say, get out of here, don't talk to me anymore, Mr. Russian guy, because that's wrong. And they didn't report these contacts to anybody. So I, I, I don't I don't have any question about that. I just I, I don't see if I thought a process existed where we could get to the truth and that it wouldn't be hopelessly politicized, which everything is. I mean, we, we really are at the point where, I mean, this administration lies all the time. And if you call them on their lying, it is viewed as a political act. I mean, a recent thing, we're going through the census thing right now. Uh, Wilbur Ross claimed that he uh, added the citizenship question because the Justice Department asked him to do it. Well, that's nope. been exposed as a complete 100 percent lie. He asked the Justice Department if he could do it. Uh, it's, it's, it is a 180 uh, inversion of the truth. But does that matter or does it become a political question? Are you being political when you call Wilbur, Wilbur Ross a liar? Well, people treat treat you that way and people treat it that way. If I thought we could get somewhere, if I thought we could get to the place that Bill's talking about, I would totally support but impeachment. Just, just, just a minute. Look, here's the thing. First of all, I mean, I, I agree. I, I wish we lived in a country in which if the president were caught telling 10,000 lies, he's the Chuck Yeager of lying. <laughs> the founders, he's broken all the uh, sound barriers. The, the founders would have thought that someone to whom this happened twice would have been gone. And that couldn't be any clearer. And so the first thing we need to do here is, is simply establish that, that while we recognize that it's not just up to the Senate in addition to the House, it's up to the public whether we impeach. It's a three, there are three uh, players here, the House, the Senate, and the American people. And they're not there yet. But, but I would just say point out, one, that it's time to say we know these are impeachable offenses. We want to stop talking about that. Do you want to know whether in our minds we know these are the kinds of things for which a president ought to be removed? We do. And for the process, I would just say that I think Trump's made two big mistakes here. One, bars lies. Uh, uh, to the Congress and to his stonewalling of all other committees. Between, if Mo between what Mueller's testimony may be, bars dishonesty to Congress, which is a crime, and the stonewalling of every attempt, Trump is creating a situation in which Democrats can look people in the eye and say, the only thing we can do here is at least start the process because that's the only way to get the documents. Uh, we got to take a break. Uh, we're talking with Bill Curry, our Democratic political analyst, Colin McEnroe, host of The Colin McEnroe Show. And when we come back, Emily Munson, state capitol reporter for Hearst Connecticut Media, will take us through what's happening at the state capitol's legislative committees, put some finishing touches on their state budget recommendations, all sorts of fun stuff in the state budget. We love talking about it here in the wheelhouse with you. This is The Wheelhouse. I'm John Dankosky. As always, you can find us at WNPR.org slash The Wheelhouse, also on Facebook and Twitter at WNPR Wheelhouse. This week, we're talking about the news with Bill Curry, our Democratic political analyst, Emily Munson, state capital reporter for Hearst Connecticut Media, and our own Colin McEnroe. Colin McEnroe, what is on your program today? On my program today, we're actually re-airing a show that we did about grammar and how grammar usage and word stuff is just changing over time. I, I, instead of mentioning that one, I, what I'd really like to say is that for tomorrow, and we've got the show under uh, all done, but it's a show about sideshows, and it includes uh, a biography of uh, a, a guy named Schlitzy, who was microcephalic and who was exhibited in sideshows for 40, 50 years. Um, and it, the biography is written by Bill Griffith, uh, the creator of Zippy, and it's mm -hmm. a very sympathetic and thoughtful uh, biography. And then also, we're going to tell you the story of uh, in the starting in the beginning of the 20th century. In Europe, they knew what to do about preemies. In America, there was no medical theory about mm -hmm. premature babies. They just either lived or died or whatever. And the one person who was able to save them for decades was this guy who brought incubators over from Europe and exhibited the preemies in the Coney Island sideshow. It's charged everybody, charged the parents nothing, charged everybody a quarter to look at these little tiny babies. And Whoa. may have saved 6,000 of them by doing it that way. 
I didn't know that story. No, I didn't know that story. That's either. amazing. That's yeah. a remarkable yeah. story. So that's tomorrow on that's the Colin tomorrow. McEnroe yeah. Show. Other stuff happening today. So the Legislature's Appropriation Committee on Tuesday passed its proposal for the spending side of the state budget for the next couple of fiscal years. The Finance Committee is also wrapping up its revenue recommendations this week. So, Emily, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll start uh, by asking you for just an overview of what these Democratic-led committees are putting into the budget and how closely they're aligning with what Governor Ned Lamont has said he wants to do. So their spending proposal is pretty close to the governor's. Um, They only recommend increasing spending over the governor's budget by less than half a percentage point um, each of the next two fiscal years. Um, But there were some key differences. They want to put some more money um, towards education grants for public schools. Um, And uh, they rejected the governor's debt diet idea. They want to take the savings that the state is going to see through – its increased uh, credit worthiness and put that money towards reversing his debt diet plan by which he wants to lower the amount of bonding that the state does. Can can we stop that for just one second here? So again, the plan is to not spend quite as much because the state has gotten into trouble over the years with just how much it has bonded. The state is newly more credit worthy than it has been in recent years. And so the Democratic plan is to say, now that we actually have a little bit of, I suppose, capital with the with the bond markets or whatever else, we're going to spend that immediately by going back to more more borrowing. So they do, they want to do slightly more borrowing <laughs> than the governor than the governor proposed. It's not more borrowing. To be clear, it's not yeah. more borrowing than we're doing now. Okay, it's just more than the governor suggested. Than the governor suggested. And in, and you know, from Democrats' point of view. They say, hey, this borrowing covers some important things. We're, we're funding school construction. Yes. We're funding the upkeep of the University of Connecticut, municipal facilities. And so they had some concerns about um, the debt diet hitting those capital projects a little too hard. And so they want to put slightly more money towards those projects than the governor suggested. Uh, when you talk about education funding, how much of the education funding that the Democrats want to do is tied to some of the ideas we've been floating about how school districts work together? I mean, are we going to spend more money on school districts, but we're going to ask them to to consolidate, do this back office stuff, or maybe even consolidate even more than they've wanted to in the past? So regionalization has taken a backseat in these budget conversations. Um, Earlier in the session, Governor Lamont saw huge backlash from the public when he suggested that school districts might be forced to share services like their superintendents or, you know, their IT offices or otherwise risk losing some state funding. Um, And, you know, after putting out that plan, he then backtracked and said, oh, wait, oh, wait, we're just going to create a commission that's going to study this and make some recommendations, but you're not going to be forced into anything small school districts. Mm. Um, And so this increased funding that we're seeing in the Appropriations Committee spending plan is not tied to regionalization whatsoever. It's just continuing to fund our education cost sharing grants at um, 2019 levels, whereas um, or at um, an increasing uh, phased in levels, the uh, the governor wanted to keep it at the current level. And mm-hmm. the Democrats said, no, let's let's follow the formula that we created and let's go to the next step up. So in just a second, I suppose we're going to talk about how to pay for all this on the tax side of it. But I just I'm just wondering, Bill, maybe you could react, first of all, to the the spending side of the of the Democrat Democrats plan that we see so far. Uh, first of all, I don't, I don't, I don't think it, it looks for enough savings. And, and Democrats are uh, as genetically wired to defend government as Republicans are to attack it. And one of the prices we pay for that is that we don't do a, a good enough job of of vouchsafing to taxpayers and voters that the shop's going to be well run. Uh, you know, the the problem with all this uh, borrowing, it's not so much how you borrow; it's what you spent the money on. If I borrow ten dollars from you and spend it on a lemonade stand that makes 20 and pay you back and put some money in my pocket, everything's good. If I spend $10 on a keg of beer or whatever you get and drink it all and never pay you back, well, that's terrible. And we've bought a lot of keggers uh, or we've been, you know, day-to-day expansion. And so the, the, the reform we need is about how we spend the money, what we can spend it on. And the second reform we need has to do with what we, you know, the, the, one of the forms of corruption 
that, that, that the OECD is an organization of all the developed countries with market economies. They found that 15 to 30 percent of all public procurement spending in their, nation, in their nations, including the United States, goes to corruption. We haven't cleaned ours up in my lifetime. And so whether it's corruption, health care, we leave lots of money on the table, and the public doesn't see us really a- attending to it. And so we have to get more, a lot more serious of, of, about our own fiscal integrity and then, and then ask for the money. Can I just pick at your business plan br- briefly for a second, Bill? If, if I gave you $10, don't open up a lemonade stand. Open up a beer stand because people will pay a lot more money for that. Did you want to jump in? I heard you, you raising you your hand. You can charge me a consulting or, fee or along with the interest lemonade. rate. <laughs> craft, yeah. craft lemonade. Uh, boy. So I, I just want to point swine. out. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just want to point out that in, in both the governor's budget and the appropriations committee budget, we are seeing Democrats reevaluating government spending Slightly in that. <laughs> There's they, that word again. <laughs> yeah. In that they are becoming more accepting of some forms of uh, privatization. So we see this in um, the, the health and mental health sections of their budget where, um, you know, the governor wants to prior privatize the operation of uh, some group homes that are now run by the state and also uh, local mental health authorities. And you know, this got pushback from um, some Democrats, but eventually in this appropriations committee budget, um, the committee said, yes, we'll pri- privatize some. No, we're gonna not going to go as far as Governor Lamont suggested. But that is, you know, it would say um, a signal that they're looking uh, to, to change some some facets yeah, of government spending. I, I, go ahead, Bill. I know you have something to say about this. I'm going to uh, call let me just say quickly, first of all, the biggest item in the in Connecticut budget, as in every state's budget, is health care. And uh, a, a test of this, I, I, I have watched those efforts and I you know, applaud them uh, quietly. But uh, uh, we've left uh, the, uh, the biggest pot of money on the table. We talk about pensions. We talk about other but, – but, but the biggest pot of money is health care. It's the biggest – Section, it's the fastest rising. There's a proposal, which I'm very proud. I introduced the first public option in the country when I was comptroller a million years ago. We fought over this for 25 years like we fight over all these things. And uh, uh, Barack Obama ran on a public option and then didn't implement it and paid a great price for it. Dan Malloy ran on a public option and then didn't implement it. Uh, Governor Lamont is running a public option. We're going to find out in the next two weeks. It's where all the savings are. It's how you bring down costs for small businesses and for the state government. And we're about to have a test when we talked before about the degree to which the government is mortgaged to private interest and thus to the past. Uh, we could be the first nation that breaks through, first state in the nation that breaks through. Others, Inslee in, in Washington, Gavin Newsom in California, there are pushes everywhere. We've been at this for 30 years. You want to do savings in the budget? You have to free yourself. You can't just grandfather in the insurance and pharmaceutical industries and keep a system that price gouges small business. The state's got to make this systemic change. It's not that radical change that's on the table. Far from it. It'll be a real test of their ability to restructure this uh, uh, budget in a way that serves the interest of taxpayers. Colin? Um, well, just to throw a couple of things. First of all, we want to we need to emphasize for the listeners, this is the Appropriations Committee. So this is like step two or three of many steps getting to a budget. Uh, there'll be a lot of things that happen in between now and a final vote on the budget and then whether or not Lamont signs the budget. Also, the budget implementers will be full of all kinds of crap that we can't even possibly antip- anticipate here. So it's it's hard. We're really looking through a glass darkly uh, at this. And um, one thing that kind of was amusing yesterday is that the, in one of the sort of bigger questions uh, about this budget was a plan to put push, push I believe, $73 million uh, in uh, municipal teacher pension costs to the municipalities away from the state. And because they made a clerical error, error. I mean, it's it's, it says something like this this idea is not recommended by the Appropriations Committee. And it turns out what they meant to say it is it's not not recommended um, <laughs> or something like that. So uh, so there was a sort of a little moment of confusion here. Uh, it, it looks like they're in favor of this too. And that'll be – I would guess that'll be one of the things that gets fought over considerably. I mean if you push that kind of money towards the municipalities, it's going to jack up property taxes. Yep. Uh, it's going to hurt certain kinds of school districts. It's going to hurt Hartford worse than it's going to hurt Reading. You know, there's just a lot of reasons, and there's some good reasons to think about this too. And if if the if the towns, it's sort of a pox on both of your houses, right? Because if the towns if towns are going to say, yeah, we don't want to regionalize, <laughs> well, okay, then pay your pension costs. Uh, 
Um, but the problem with it is that the same people get hurt over and over no matter what you do. And those are the poor, underfunded education programs in cities. One quick little extra fact from yesterday. We've talked about this in the past, so I'll bring it up. It's a minor thing. Yeah. But the Appropriations Committee, I believe, decided that uh, you should be able to go to the bathroom in a building on I-95 anytime you want. So I think it keeps uh, all the rest areas open 24-7 and I think also has some welcoming centers uh, in it. And uh, I actually think that's – you know, it's more important than people think. You know, it's just like one thing that people don't like about Connecticut. Like you go up through Vermont and there are all these nice welcoming centers along I-91 and stuff like that. So anyway, that's all. OK. So we're going to have welcoming centers. That's a good thing. How are we going to pay for all this, Emily? So wait, what is the taxing plan as of right now? And are Democrats going to go with – we were talking about progressives in, in the state legislature. Are they going to go with a plan that starts to add more taxes to the top earners here in the state or not really? Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. And obviously, Ned Lamont has not been terribly interested in that. What are we hearing about taxes right now? So we are going to get the um, the legislature's tax plan um, probably tomorrow, um, and there's another there's a key vote today on uh, a number of tax proposals bills that they've been looking at. Um, but what we've seen so far is there have been pro- proposals. Um, to, to raise taxes on the wealthy through, for example, a capital gains tax. Um, and, and yesterday in, in a key vote, um, you know, that was that was substituted with a study bill, which is basically a signal that Democrats are are backing off that idea because Governor Lamont um, drew a hard line in the sand and said, no, I will not support that. So um, as as we look to the tax plan coming out tomorrow, I think we probably won't see some of the more radical progressive proposals in that budget. But it will be very interesting to see, um, for example, if they go along with Governor Ned Lamont's proposed um, expansion of the sales tax, uh, which is something that many Democrats have criticized uh, because it would apply the sales tax to more goods um, that uh, – low-income residents use like uh, laundry, coin-op laundry, even parking, um, your veterinarian visits, uh, haircuts, uh, things like that. Um, and and uh, also on the sales tax, they're considering raising it a half a percent um, to provide some more revenue to struggling municipalities. Um, so those those will be key things to watch. Um, struggling municipalities that are going to have to pay more for, for teacher pensions and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and 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 just in general, you mis- municipalities here in Connecticut are solely dependent on the property tax in they order are. to raise their income. And so many um law- lawmakers, you know, democratic moderates as well as progressives are saying we need to rethink this structure because our towns are not um positioned to support themselves well and um the property tax model doesn't incentivize um towns to implement aggressive strategies on economic development, whereas if they had um, a, a foot in the game with the sales tax, they would want to bring you know, more stores and such to their their town. So we're going to find out a little bit more about that. I mean, I, I, I don't know, Bill, where, where do you want to start with that? Because you, you've been talking about the property tax for, for a very long time. But um, uh, the, the, it is the single uh, tax reform that people in the state and across the country uh, want the most. It's the single uh, tax that in every poll ever taken is the most unpopular. It's the most regressive. Uh, it has that effect. In addition to what Emily said, it, 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 it drives sprawl, which makes mass transportation impossible and makes it impossible to bring your central cities back. There's no relief in Connecticut on the tax side without comprehensive property tax reform. And there's no relief on the spending side without comprehensive health care re- reform. That's where the two big parts of money that are being neurotically misallocated by these broken systems. I don't quite get the governor's strategy and I have great hopes for him and, I, and, I, and, and I, you know, I see lots of good things happening here. But he seems committed to two taxes, uh, to a toll, which I understandably for environmental and other reasons, I get it. Uh, it would be a lot easier to sell that toll if it were tied as we we're talking before about what Democrats have to do to meet the legitimate concerns of voters and taxpayers. Uh, it would be be an easier sell if it were tied to a specific strategy of of mass transportation improvement. Uh, uh, But it's always going to be difficult. 
They've, they're betting the farm on tolls and sales taxes. At the same time, an increase in the income tax at the top rate, a majority of Republicans are for it. All Democrats are for it. The vast majority of unaffiliated voters are for it. And it's the fairest and best thing for our economy. What Colin and Emily were saying is, you know, that, that, that this is just the approach committee. Now we're about to get the finance committee and we have a progressive group that hasn't weighed in yet. The question is whether, uh, in my experience, legislature, uh, each day you get closer to the end, the members start to feel the heat of their decisions from the public more and more intensely. The question is whether these progressives are going to step back and say, we are not going to pass a tax pass uh, package that adds to, to the burdens of the middle class unduly and that is regressive. And we're going to answer the call across the country and in our own state to make the wealthy pay a little bit more so we have a little more of fairness here. And if they reach the point where those sales tax increases and the tolls and all of it become so painful to them that they, it'll be on the tax side, not the spending side, the, the budget falters if it does. When the, bu- when the first budget doesn't pass, yeah. that's actually the beginning of the session. Yeah. That's when the session begins. <laughs> and that's when we find out whether or not at that point, whether those – and then we find out whether those progressives want to really weigh in and insist on some real change. Colin? Well – I, I do get Ned Lamont's policies, uh, like what they are. I mean, I don't agree with them, but I mean, I, in an odd way, I think he's been fairly consistent about this um, and, and in a way that a lot of other administrations have struggled to be. Because if your policy winds up being, as it typically does, once the legislature and the governor get through with it, a kind of diffusion of pain, like, oh, let's have everybody will share the pain a little bit. We'll do a little bit here and a little bit there and a little bit here. He's not doing that. I mean, if you do that, you wind up with no policy. He has a policy. His policy is, I think, heavily based on the Smith Patricelli Doomsday Panel uh, report, which was all about the expansion of, of the sales tax and not for, for the most about progressive reforms. I have very close friends who worked on that report, but it was stacked with exactly the kinds of business establishment uh, people who are going to go that way, you know, and are not going to want to have any kind of progressive tax reform or progressive taxation uh, additions at all. And that's where Ned is right now. It's a very millionaire and billionaire friendly policy uh, and it, he's pretty consistent about it. So you got to give him that anyway. Uh, a last thought on, on taxes, Emily, what we're going to see next? Well, I just wanted to return to Colin's thought on, um, you know, Lamont's policy. And I would say at the heart of it is this this central worry that many Democrats share is if if we raise taxes on the wealthy, are they going to flee our state? And that was a huge message during the 2018 campaign. Um, and uh, Democrats are are still sorting through their answers to this question, and um, and I don't think they've landed on a good solution. You know, the wealthy are the the best position to avoid taxes, right? They can employ, um, you know, tax accountants to help them get around the policies, and they're the most mobile. Um, and they have an important role in our economy by running companies and employing other people in our state, and so. Um, how that pieces together with um, the desire to to not burden um, the middle and lower class is something that the Democrats are really wrestling with right now um, all across the spectrum. And um, I don't think that they have arrived on a clear answer about whether raising the income tax will result in more out migration. And they don't have clear information. Look, there's a limit. Uh, state versus federal. The states have to worry about this race to the bottom of all the states competing with their economic and tax uh, development and tax policies. We're not there yet. I mean, the, the most the most of what I've seen tells me that we can be where the rest of our region is uh, at taxing the upper limits here, and 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 not see any real effect on that. There's been so much propaganda from those very from CBIA and others so systematically for ten years unanswered that people think that our overall tax burden on the wealthy is much heavier than it really is, and that that concern is greater than it is. It's a real concern. We're not there yet. I, Emily, got to ask you one last thing about taxes, though, and, and this gets into another issue that is probably about more than just just taxes. Uh, what are we going to do with recreational marijuana this this session? Because it's certainly come up from the very start. Ned Lamont has talked about it. Other states around us are diving all in. What are we doing with pot right now? Uh Pots on the table, but support. Um, it's it's unclear whether it's going to pass this year. Uh, from talking to legislature legislators, um, you know, uh, the finance committee had a big hearing on Monday about how we should tax um, marijuana. What kind of revenue is this going to bring to the state, and what should we do with that money? Um, 
But uh, the governor um, has not included that in their budget. We'll see if the uh, Revenue Committee, Finance and Revenue Committee, puts money from marijuana in their budget. That will be a good sign to indicate their predictions on passage. But from what I'm hearing, there are a number of Democrats on the fence. Mm. Emily Munson, State Capitol reporter for Hearst Connecticut Media. Bill Curry's here, our Democratic political analyst and the host of the Colin McEnroe Show. The aptly named Colin McEnroe is here as well. When we come back, we're going to have some feats of strength, maybe some grumbles about the week's news here in the wheelhouse. This is The Wheelhouse. I'm John Dankosky. The cameras of CTN, the Connecticut Network, are here. That's why I'm talking directly to camera. We've got time for some grievances or maybe some feats of strength. Bill Curry, go ahead. What's yours? Um, I'll give you both. I, I, what I, I, I am, as always, very impressed with our comptroller, Kevin Limbo, who has taken these health care issues and fought hard and gotten real savings. Uh, but as he'd be the first to tell you, you need really syst- real systemic reform of uh, the kind we're talking about. And my grievance is this. The two topics today are examples, infrastructure and health care. It's like all we get is Bill Murray and Punxsutawney Phil, and we'd be in Groundhog Day. All my life, we've been putting these off. And, uh, you know, watching, <laughs> watching Game of Thrones, I think, like, you know, a- after, a- after a millennia— No spoilers. Of, after, well, all I want to say is, <laughs> all I want to say is, where's our Arya Stark? <laughs> there okay? we go. Where's our person to come through and cut through and get us to a conclusion on these things? It's killing me. They're they're destroying time itself. It's a it may be a little bit of a spoiler. Emily, how about you? What's your you have a grievance? You have a feat of strength? I have I have a grievance. Um I was I was dif- disappointed to see uh the um a defamation league report that came out yesterday highlighting um, a, another year of high um, incidence of anti-Semitic events here in Connecticut. A little less than last year, so maybe that's positive, but these numbers are disheartening. Yeah, and the national numbers are, are really, really terrible in the midst of all the other things that we're seeing. It, it, that is a, a very bad sign indeed. Yes. Colin, how about you? Uh, my feat of strength uh, is in Bridgeport. It goes to my new political hero. Oh, Mar- I love this. Maria, Maria <laughs> Pereira. So last week, or rough, more than a week ago now, she got into a beef with Ernie yeah. Newton, who's on the council, uh, that culminated and became a national story on CNN with the two of them both peeing in cups and taking drug tests to prove that they're not on, on drugs. That they didn't do that on be. CNN, just no, they to be didn't clear. Do that. Okay, no. I just want to make sure Wolf everyone understands. Just to yeah. show how how it's done, but um, <laughs> and and so then she, she her next step was she decided this guy on the board of education wasn't living where he spo- says he lives, a guy named Chris Taylor. So she arranged for a fake cake delivery to his house, a two man cake team showing up to deliver a cake to Chris. For some reason or other, they needed to go up to the second floor, uh, and they're like videoing his bathroom to see whether he has toiletries there or whether it's just kind of a fake apartment. So, so I just want to make sure I understand. So somebody guy show, two guys show up with a cake. Are they wearing like? Like outfits that suggest that they're from the cake delivery. Yeah, it's like place. Mission Impossible. It said like Acme Cake Delivery. On the <laughs> so I, I don't really know. I don't know that detail. But my favorite thing about all this is that yeah. Taylor. He knew there was something fishy about two guys delivering a cake and needing to go up to the second floor. But he thought because there's a complaint filed against him by Maria Pereira that it was the State Elections Enforcement Commission. You know, well the State Elections Enforcement Commission is this overburdened, understaffed agency. They are not running no Serpico jive cake operations. <laughs> that take two people, you know, Michael Brandy, although Michael Brandy, step up your game, okay? Let's see a little bit more of this kind of stuff, you know? <laughs> I like the, they're one of our sponsors, by the way, Two Men in a Cake. Two Men in a Cake. They, they show up <laughs> and they deliver, they deliver cakes anywhere. I, I want to give both, it's a little bit of a, a grievance and it's also a feat of strength. I was listening this morning to um, NPR this morning and they have one of the very few people who covers military and veterans affairs full time in all of the national media. His name is Quill Lawrence. He's been doing this for quite some time. And he did a story that I think will make an awful lot of us grumble today. And you can read uh, his reporting and hear a lot more about his reporting as well. Dozens of lawmakers have signed a letter to the Trump administration demanding to know why there has been a drastic slowdown in granting U.S. visas to Afghans and Iraqis who helped U.S. forces. Tens of thousands of people put their lives on the line and their families' lives on the line to help our American military to do battle in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they were given a promise that they were going to be able to get entry into this country for them and their family. I've heard from my very good friend, uh, Ann Garrels, the longtime war correspondent over there, that the folks who did that work did some of the greatest work at the most peril. And the fact that we're not allowing them to come into this country and, and really fulfill that promise, it really is criminal. So a feat of strength to Quill and Annie and everyone else who covers that particular story. I want to thank all of our guests 
guest today, Bill Curry, our Democratic political analyst. Thank you, Bill. Great to be here. Thank you also to Emily Munson, state capital reporter for Hearst Connecticut Media. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, John. Colin McEnroe, the host of the Colin McEnroe Show. Thank you, Colin. Thank you, Mr. Dankowski. Our program is produced by the jet lag Scott Breedy. Our executive producer is Katie Solarski. Kion Wolf is the technical producer. Thank you so much for joining us here in the wheelhouse.